bear with me here. I had hemorrhoid surgery on my nose here a week ago, and I'm still draining a little from that. Um, it was interesting. I, I asked my nose surgeon, I said, um, how did I get a hemorrhoid in my nose? Um, he said, well, you know, there's a number of reasons why that can happen. If you have hemorrhoids below, you don't take care of them, they can spread. And on a rare occasion, they can get up into your nose. So um, if that happens, you need to seriously look at some sinus surgery. So I, I guess that's what happened to me. He said, uh, well, there's another reason why that can happen. And that is some people have their head up there, you know what, for so many years, well, it just then uh, moves up into their nose area. So I can't really tell you why I got the hemorrhoid. All I know is I got it cut out and he went in there and routed out a whole bunch of infection that's been up there for whoever knows how long, but God. So bear with me here, all right? Ah. Okay, just been on my heart a lot these days. You know, I'm 72 and a half years old as of this taping. And I think a lot about my past years and think a lot about have I accomplished God with my time and energies? Have I accomplished some things, a lot of things, a few things that's been pleasing to you since I got born again? saved, born again back in the early 1980s. And, you know, am I doing right with whatever time remains? And I think he has said, yeah, he says, yep, your primary call that I've had on your life, you've been doing that. Um, you've been trying to be used to help people make a decision to, uh, put their trust in Jesus Christ as their savior of their sins and challenging them to let him be Lord of their lives. And all other aspects of ministry have been secondary. And so I'm gonna just expound a little bit on that and that I've got something on my heart that I just wanna document and put it up on YouTube because at age 72 and a half, uh, you know, the days are getting shorter before I'm not going to be able to speak um, on video and put it out there and let God use it if he so wills. Um, before going a little further, I just should say, I, if you didn't catch it, um, it's really a polyp that they took, the doctor took out of my nose. It's been there for over 30 years and then had a deviated septum and... Uh, he said that if we take both of those, if take the polyp out and straighten out the nose a little bit, you should be less prone to have sinus infection every winter, which I have for every year. I've had it for about three months through 1918, going into 19, 2018, 2019, I'm sorry. So um, just wanted to have a little uh, hoot here and not get too serious because we're going to get serious here for a lot of folks. I think a lot about Mark in the book of Mark, New Testament book of Mark, chapter 16, uh, verse 15 and 16. Jesus is talking. He's talking to some of his disciples at that time, and he's saying, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Pretty simple, really, when you think about it. He's talking about two places where we will spend eternity, either in heaven or in hell, because that's where the Bible points it, uh, where we will be condemned forever and having to pay the penalty for all of our sins for eternity without end. And God doesn't want any of us ending up at the end of our lives condemned 
whereby we cannot spend eternity enjoying being in his presence forevermore. Living with eternal joy, in other words. That's what he wills for every one of us. And uh, I think a lot about, I mean, you think a lot about it. There, there's no third option here. You're either going to be in heaven, you're going to be in hell, right? I mean, it makes it really clear in this portion of Scripture. Salvation comes by believing. Salvation is forgiveness for our sins against God and others. Those will be forgiven if we make the decision to do what God says we need to do to have our sins forgiven. And that is to believe. Believe what? Good question. Holy Spirit wants us asking him that question. Mm -hmm. Believe that the death, burial, and resurrection, the death of Jesus Christ, in fact, is all that was required, but nothing less than that requirement to have us forgiven for our sins. So that when we die, when we have our judgment day, when we have our appointment with God, and we all will have our appointment with God, Scripture certainly clearly indicates such. Sin's not going to be an issue. This is not going to be an issue if we have put our trust that what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross was totally 100% acceptable to God to have our sins erased, forgiven by him, thereby not held against us. So what we have to look forward to then is, okay, future eternal rewards that God decides he's going to give us at that time. For the unsaved, no excuse will hold up. Condemned, condemned will be the judgment from God the judge. Because you refused to believe that my sacrifice on the cross is the only way I provided for mankind to have their sins against me and others forgiven so they can be totally free from any condemnation once they ask forgiveness and trust in what I accomplished for them on the cross. There's no other recourse. It's been recorded in my book for humanity. It has been decreed in writing, eternal condemnation. So that's what God has had me involved in over the many years, is trying to help people make a decision to be wise, don't refuse salvation, the free gift of salvation. Make a decision before it's too late. Make your choice, yes, to Jesus and what he accomplished for you and no to condemnation, no to eternal condemnation, having to pay the penalty for your sins. I've been called primarily to publish salvation, born again testimonies of believers. We've done that in many, my wife and I have done that in many different forms for oof, or 35 years, uh, again, as of this taping, and uh, done that a number of ways. But the last, the last many years, it's been on a preciousTestimonies.com website, and and uh, we've then moved to video YouTube primarily. Now we played on full-length uh, salvation testimonies of people who would let us film them. Um, we put them out on cable TV, public access stations that would allow them to play. We did that for years. We had broadcast playing every day of the week around the country. Uh, praise God. And then uh, those stations have dried up, and I won't get into the reasons why, and the doors have closed for us to do that. In most places, we do it in a few channels that still exist that allow us to do that. But primarily, God is has moved us to YouTube, and YouTube is, is a medium whereby God is using to let uh, truth go out across the world for those who are able 
to uh, tap into it. And uh, so, YouTube seems to be the number one arena in which we are to be ministering in. Over 35 years, having a call to publish testimonies in, in written form, and then on into video form, and then both, uh, it has been nothing short of absolutely astounding amazement of how so many born-again Christians have come up with excuses to not write out, speak their, their born-again salvation testimony wisely shared uh, with humility, with facts, where there's some substance to it, and then the changes that God has brought about in their lives, giving him glory, but for the purpose of letting God use that, how he might want to use it, to plant water in the lives of others, which is the biggest reason why we should never, ever say no to an opportunity to share our salvation testimony to either one individual or to millions. And it can go out to millions on YouTube really can, God wills, uh, and, uh, or potentially millions can see it over time, I should say it that way, and, uh, it, but it, 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 it amazes me, it astounds me how so many truly born-again Christians can find so many reasons to put off sharing their testimony and giving it to God to use as he might will to use it. And then hear about they died. Go to their funeral, a few of them, but hear that they died. Never getting around to giving God a public record of what he did for them for God to use. It's been sad. It's sad. I think it is sad. God is saying it's sad. But you know, this is not gonna it's not gonna sit well with a lot of Christians hearing me. But those who just come up with various reasons not to let God use their salvation testimony publicly, to go out on a website and or in a book or a track or and or YouTube, they're only hurting themselves. It's one thing to get to heaven. It's quite another thing when we enter into this arena of eternal rewards. A lot of Christians just come under the uh, demonic delusion we all get the same rewards when we get to heaven. It's not the Bible. There's variation of rewards. God doesn't say a whole lot about it other than you decide. You decide, Christian, <laughs> what you're going to do about eternal rewards. Do you want maximized eternal rewards or just kind of a few? Okay. I, the God I know doesn't say, don't settle for just a few. Get sold out daily. Ask me, you know, what can I do for you, Lord, that would be pleasing to you? And when we do that, We've got this mindset of, hey, my life is counting for eternal purposes, and uh, I'm not going to hang my head in, in letting uh, the, the rewards being the end result of it all. Jesus is the one who said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, don't lay up rewards for yourself on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, I've thought God a whole long time about, well, what are the treasures you're talking about? And God is saying, lost souls, what more could I want? I mean, my demonstration or the proof of that is I came and died for lost sinners. What more could I want than this lost soul saved of every person that ever is born on planet Earth? I've got all other riches. The one thing I don't have is somebody's will, and I won't bend their will. I've given them free will to decide whether they want to put their trust in what I accomplished for them on the cross at Calvary or now I'll take my chances and try to get into heaven and stay there for eternity some other way. 
or to have such a hardened heart, I don't really care. And that's where so many people are. Their hearts are so hardened, I don't care. I don't care for the hell, but or hell, I don't care. I'll go where I'm supposed to go, in case of rah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. Demonstration of a sad, sad state of affairs, but so much of humanity. That's how their life ends. Uh, my friend, let me just share a couple of things that will really sting with a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians come under demonic fear. They don't realize it is demonic fear. Satan knows what God can do with a well shared salvation testimony. He knows. He knows full well what God can do with a well shared salvation testimony. Doesn't have to be a you know, I went to heaven or went to hell or somewhere in between testimony. It's just this is how far down I was in sin, and God bailed me out of it, and I am so thankful for it. And now here's some of the positive changes come about in my life as evidence that he's alive and well in my life, okay? And I thank him for it. I eternally owe him for it. Uh, and, and so a lot of Christians don't realize the, the level of warfare that Satan launches against them to keep them from writing out or and or speaking their salvation testimonies. There's a second category that I've heard so many say, well, well, Brother Norm, yeah, I, I don't mind letting God use my testimony, but he's not done writing it yet. And when it's done, you know, yeah, then I'll look at it then. And I say, well, well how long have you been saved? Well, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or maybe longer, maybe a little shorter. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't even think you know what salvation is. I, I usually don't say that to them because they don't want to hear They don't know what salvation is. Their whole mindset is, is, you know, maybe I'll get to heaven and maybe I won't. And if I don't sin as often as I have in the past, maybe God will find grace for me. That ain't salvation. That's called sanctification. That's a whole different topic in spiritual circles. Salvation is making a decision to believe Exactly what God says we must do. Mark 16, 15, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And who doesn't will be condemned. That's what saves us. Believing, not doing. Now, if we believe and it hurts right, we will be doing things that are pleasing to God. But that's just the sanctifying process that really is a measurement of who truly belongs to Jesus Christ and who's just playing mind games with him, but I won't get off on that tangent. I also won't get off on the t tangent, which is easy to get off on, about baptism. I, baptism doesn't save us. Baptism is a holy ordinance God has given Christians to engage in. I believe it is a commandment. But not everybody can be baptized. The thief on the cross didn't have a chance to be baptized. I know prisoners who have are spending most of their adult life in prison, and they don't have an opportunity to be baptized. How about them? Will they be thrown out of heaven because they didn't get back now? If you read the entire New Testament, it's what we believe based on our trust in what God accomplished for us on the cross that saves us. But there's a whole lot of positive things to be said about baptism, so I don't want anybody to think it's not important to be baptized. Um, there's a whole entire thorough teaching on baptism. Being baptized into Jesus Christ is what he wants us to understand is so valuable. Who we are in Christ, our position that God the Father says we are in Christ. There is another baptism that God would like us to understand, and that is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is the Acts uh, experience, if you will, the book of Acts experience of being empowered by the Holy Spirit to be active witnesses. Witnesses to who? To the unsaved, 
to those who have not made a decision to put their trust in Jesus Christ. That's why we need empowerment from God to overcome fear, intimidation, uh, all kinds of different reasons why we may not be so uh, eager, desirous, care about being used to help somebody else make a decision for Jesus Christ that they might escape, escape hell and be in eternity for forever. Okay, that's the purpose of receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit, primarily. There are secondary issues. Galatians 5 would get into that. I'm not going to get off on this tangent. All I'm saying is that what we believe is critical up to the moment our heart stops beating. All right. So, my friend... If you have written out, given God your salvation testimony to use, well, bless God, you're a wise person. If you haven't, don't put it off. Ask God how to structure it out, depending on the format, but it'll be out there. Let God use that till he, uh, as long as he wants. And we don't know how long that might be. We don't know. He keeps that a secret. But he can't use it if you don't give it to him to use, can he? I've said it a number of times. God's not obligated our, to use our salvation testimony, but I can assure you of this. He can't use it if we don't give it to him first to use. And my experience is anytime you share with appreciation and thanksgiving what he did for you based on what he accomplished on the cross, you reaching out and grabbing the free gift of salvation and not getting off on agendas uh, by the time people get done hearing and reading your testimonies that have nothing to do with eternal life and truth, uh, he'll use it. He will use it. And uh, you can't imagine how much he'll use it over time. But he can't use it if you don't give it to him to use. If you've written out or shared your salvation testimony publicly so God can use that over and over as much as he wants to, then, my friend, challenge other born-again Christians to, to write out and or speak their salvation testimonies and whatever else the Holy Spirit would lead them to share. Give it to God before their heart stops beating. Satan absolutely hates Christians giving to God for him to use their salvation testimonies. I could go on for 10 hours trying to convince the audience of how oh, much Satan does not want Christians giving God their salvation testimonies so he can use them as he wills. Salvation testimonies out in the highways and byways is probably the most threatening thing there is to Satan. I'm so thankful of having access to real life story Christian testimony books. Just one of many resources that God has given my wife and I an opportunity to put out. These, these, these real life story testimony books goes where a Christian can't go. You put these books out like we have for well over 10 years now, growing on 15 years. Just put them out where people can find them. The Holy Spirit moves people who are ready, who are ready, will pick them up and take them home and read them. Now you go knock on that same person's door and ask them if you could come in and talk to them about spiritual truth, talk about Jesus, something of that nature. No, thank you. And they'll close the door in your face. Okay. You're not going to be able to witness to them. But they'll take this because they can sneak it from a pile laid out. Nobody sees them. They can sneak it, take it home, read it in privacy where nobody will catch them. And it is doing witnessing for God. Many ways to witness. This book filled with little simple salvation testimonies. All of the various editions that Step-by-Step -step Ministries, uh, of all the different editions of Real Life Stories, they put out and continue to put out that's going around the world that God is using to, to touch souls, to win souls to Christ. 
that's mind boggling. But the point is, what's in it? A bunch of preaching? Preaching, 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 teaching, preaching. T no, that's for people who's already made a decision for Jesus Christ. And they're maturing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Real life stories, content of this nature is designed to get people to make a decision to Jesus Christ. That's the starting point. Okay? So, my friend, get your salvation testimony written and or on video format and probably video format is much easier for people than writing. Many people struggle with writing, I know. So just share it and uh, keep sharing it until you got a version of it that makes sense so people can understand what you're saying. Oh my gosh, don't put music in the background. I hate to say it. Leave music alone when you share your testimony. Christian music is wonderful in a lot of other places, but not when you share your testimonies. People don't want to hear competing sounds when you're sharing the most important thing you can share to them, and that is how God has become real and alive in your life, what he's done for you, and convince me that Jesus is the way that I should choose like you have chosen. I can't believe the number of people testifying who's got to have music playing in the background and nine times out of ten it's so loud you can't hear easily what the person is saying who's testifying and I, Satan just absolutely loves when Christians play Christian music especially too loud uh, on a testimony okay leave it alone you don't need it people ain't there listening to Christian music they're there to hear what you have to say about God and what he's done for you Okay, uh, I say that over and over. It seems like it falls on deaf ears too, but hey, I do what little I can. And, and uh, so my friend, uh, we all got these high-tech cell phones. Uh, and we can turn that thing around, put it in a video format, and we can speak and put, put it all together. And we can get a YouTube account, it's free, or somebody else can do it for us. And we can upload that and start. It may not be the most perfectly Wonderfully, most anointed shared, but to start it is the biggest step. You know, I go back and redo it again. You can tweak it, fine tune it, uh, and re remove the old one and put up a new one. There's a process many times it comes with sharing your salvation testimony with impact, okay? And uh, so I'm going to kind of end it there. Uh, for those of you who's made it this far, um, hopefully. My old nose, I can get more air out of both sides. They found some pus pockets that needed to be drained up there. I've come to the understanding that you can have sinus infection your entire life, potentially, and never real realize that it's there. Uh, it never leaves year-round, and it may lie dormant, usually lies dormant for most people during the summer, during the months where it gets warmer, and then it just starts breeding and growing come winter like it has for me and so uh, had I known you know that it can do that I probably should have had I would have had surgery uh, up in the sinus cavities you know 30 40 years ago when I first learned that I had uh, a hemorrhoid uh, slash <laughs> polyp up there and uh, deviated septum so you know, if you have issues with sinus infection, chronic sinus infections, you might want to prayerfully um, talk to a good ear, nose, throat doctor about it. They'll do a simple CAT scan and look at the inside picture. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're not having sinus issues, I don't know about allergy issues, but if you're not having chronic sinus issues where, like me, it gets so bad and I have to take the antibiotics and the antibiotics rip my guts up, make me feel terrible before I'm done with them. And then I'm good to go for about a month or two and then it comes back before summer comes on. So we'll take a second dose of antibiotics to get rid of it. And then once the temperature gets up above 50 degrees and stays there, usually I'm good to go until it starts dropping again here in Michigan. Oh, usually first part of December. So. So I hope that that will solve that issue. And um, so praise God. Thanks for putting up with me and uh, my friend. 
So many Christians really have a mindset of, God, what can you do for me? What can you do for me today? A lot of it comes from listening to bad teachers. God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God wants to, oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God. He just wants to bless you every which way. Bless you growing in and blowing out. And man, the old ears, the old flesh loves hearing that. We'll give our money and time and allegiance to ministers like that. Or mega churches that are growing, abounding in dollars and influence. And that's primarily what they're pumping out. If all they pump out is, you know what? If you're wise, every day you will ask God, what can I do to please you today? And mean it. You will be amazed in eternity just how rich you were in this life. That's the difference between eternal riches and not such eternal riches. This is what God can do for me. He's already done the most important thing he can do for me. He died on the cross and took the punishment for all my sins, as he has done for you. <laughs> that alone will reward me with eternal joy being in heaven. But you know what? He doesn't want us to end it there. He's told us in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, there's more than just getting to heaven. Lay up rewards for yourself while you're able to before your heart stops. Now, if you're on some sort of guilt trip and don't feel like you should be doing anything for eternal rewards, which Satan will try to convince you, uh, we're not supposed to do anything for rewards. I mean, that's, that, that, that's way out there in left field here, Norm. Uh, it's okay. Me? I'm willing to give them all to Jesus. I'm willing to pass them out. I don't, I don't need them. But I'm not going to be stupid. I, I, God has revealed too much to me. You know, there is this scripture where, where we're told where, you know, Jesus says, for those who have been forgiven much, much will be required. Another scripture says those have been given much uh, uh, will love much. And uh, if you ever heard my testimony of, to any degree, I, 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 I tortured, killed people in Vietnam and called it war, justified it. So it's beyond just engaging in sin and hoping God wasn't a whole lot concerned about it. So God has forgiven me of a whole lot. And I've come to realize I owe him a whole lot. I owe him because he did not have to do what he did on the cross for me. And I owe him. And I think God wants every one of us to realize we all owe him because he gave us a free pass to have our sins against him and others forgiven so that they would not be held against us on the judgment day. How can you not play with God's plan? How can we go against God's plan of having our sins forgiven? But Satan has handed humanity a zillion which ways to bypass that being the only acceptable way that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit clearly says will get us into heaven when we die. It's the only way to have our sins removed that are held against us until we have them removed from God. Okay? And he will forgive them instantly. If we ask him to forgive us, 1 John 1, 9, confess our sins as much as we can, ask for forgiveness. Thank him then for immediate forgiveness. We don't have to wallow around in confusion and doubt that, well, did he forgive me or didn't I? Satan tried to convince you that you need to wallow around in doubt and confusion forever. No, you're forgiven as soon as you ask, as soon as you trust that he has forgiven you based on what he did, not what you do, beyond that point, okay? And just rest in that. Rest in it. You're saved. When you did that, you got a salvation testimony to share. That is your salvation testimony. But it doesn't do a whole lot for the unsaved, so you need to share what has happened after that. You need to share some after. You need to share some of the wonderful things that God has been doing in your life, what he means to you, how precious he is to you. Bring him up. God loves to be bragged up for the right reasons. Okay, 
Brag him up. You know? Uh, you're a trophy on his wall. Satan wants to remove you as a trophy from God's wall. If he, Satan can't have you as his trophy, well, he will not have you as God's trophy either, okay? So we can be doing so much, but it starts with a mindset that will pay us back eternal reward and give Jesus Christ more joy in eternity. Because after all, that's what it's going to be all about anyway, is giving him God joy. And out of that, he's going to give it back to us to however he wants to measure that out to us, each of us. But um, it starts with a mindset, God, what can I do to please you today? And mean it. It isn't about what can you do to please me, God. What can I do to please you? With a mindset like that, God will put his favor on you and things can be accomplished that doesn't cost a penny. All it costs is a little time, a little sacrifice of your time and energy to be used of him. And he's got myriads of ways to use each of us until our time is done down here. All right. Be blessed, my friend. Thanks for hearing me out.